Good morning. And uh, just want to tell you this morning, Jan, if I had a gas pedal up in the front seat for the organ, I would have laid on the gas full, full throttle, okay? So get me, get me back the next song, all right? I had to follow the dance. Oh, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> she was being kind. If you, if you never filled out a Connect card and this is your first time with us this morning, we'd love for you to fill one of these out. But even if this is your 500th time with us this morning, I'm trying to think how many Sundays that would be, okay. Fill one of these out with a prayer request and let us know how we could be praying for you over the next week. We'd love to be praying for you, however that means. So drop one of these in the offering plates on your way out. And uh, we would love to read these, pray for you, and get to know you if you fill one of these out for the first time. Did anyone happen to catch the uh, word of the day today? Let's see. Anybody? All right. Oh, here we go. Three, two, one. Bribe. Bribe. That was the word of the day. And it was on the announcement slide that was attached to the quarterly business meeting. And the reason it was is because I wish I could bribe you to come on out to the quarterly business meeting, but I won't bribe you, so you should just come anyway. Although I do sometimes hand out candy for if you ask questions, so that's not really a bribe, but it kind of is, so... Anyway, we will have that Wednesday night in place of Bible study. So if you've been regularly coming to Bible study, at least come on out for a quarterly business meeting. And for those of you church members who um, haven't been coming out for Bible study, we need you at the quarterly this week. So mark Wednesday night at, on your calendar. We need you there for that. And that'll be a great time of both catching up on what's been happening, looking forward to the future of what's going to happen, and then going through a few things that we need to talk about, vote on, and so on. So please join us for that meeting. Um, you also notice that out on the foyer table, if you're a lady here this morning, there's an opportunity. We, we uh, are making up that paint night that we missed. And so ladies, if you'd like to sign up, please put your name down. Even if you think you might be able to go, just put your name down, see Heidi, talk to her. We'd love to have you join out, for, get as many ladies out for the paint night as possible. There's no limit, so we can invite lots of people, but you do have to let Heidi know so we can have a pretty accurate number um, on that Friday night. So that would be great. That's on the 20th, I believe. Yep, Friday night, 20th to 7 p.m. Also, a big thing happening next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. And it's never too late to get baptized. I mean that in both terms of age, but also in terms of you can let us know this week and we'd still let you join in on that baptism service as long as you have time to meet with pastor in advance. And so baptism Sunday is coming up and we have a, quite a few people ready, excited about baptism and we are too. So please join us that Sunday and make sure you're here next Sunday at church to celebrate some people who have dedicated their life to Christ and want to tell all of you, tell the world that they love Jesus. That'll be really awesome. I think the next biggest thing I just want to really point out is the church picnic because it's at a different place this year. All right? New location for the church picnic. Set that in. New location. All right? So it's right over here at Riverside. Is that west? Yeah. East. east. He says east. No, west. It is west. west yeah. Well, one of the Riversides. You'll find us if you show up. <laughs> It is west, and it's by the splash pad, so there you go. Come prepared to jump in the splash pad. Bring a swimsuit if you want to go in the river at all and swim in the river. Annalise and I do that there a lot, and there's quite a few other things, so we ask you to bring a dish to pass just like normal, and, and that'll be a great time. That's in two Sundays from now. That'll be really good. So the, then the last thing is Awana. Awana is coming up. Awana is starting up, and so if you've helped with Awana back in 2019, um, we are just kind of hoping you, you just head right back to that table today at the end of service and write your name down. And if you're new and you'd like to help with the WANA or you used to help, but now you've got some more free time on Sunday nights and you'd like to start helping again, that would be awesome. And we would really take you in and, and any way, shape, or form that you would like to help. We can have you listening to verses or helping out in the nursery, helping in a classroom. There's lots of opportunities to serve at Awana, and we need plenty of people to do that. So please do sign up for Awana, it, especially if, you know, Gary helps with Awana every year, but make sure you put your name on the list, Gary, all right? After church. Okay, he, he said yes. Deal. So that's about it for pre uh, announcements this Sunday. We'll, we'll be excited to see you there Wednesday night for the quarterly, but praise team's going to come up. Gary's going to lead us in songs and jokes and uh, <laughs> maybe just songs. I don't know. Just, 
You know, if he's going to bribe me to come Wednesday night, he needs to tell me the type of candy bar we're having, okay? I don't know. <laughs> and if there's Mountain Dew there. Glad you're here today. If you're visiting for the first time, very special welcome. Uh, this is just a special day uh, to worship the Lord. So let's stand as we get prepared to sing this morning. that this morning and say amen. 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 You may be seated, please. Psalm 63, 1. You, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, and my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Continue to worship and sing with us. Thank you. 
we read in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 26. Brothers and sisters, thinking, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Please sing with us, I will boast. talks about boasting. Sometimes we don't as Christians want to boast, do we? I mean, we always say that has a bad connotation, but we need to be able to uh, share the things that we have and the great things that take place. We've, you know, I look at the whole month of August as we go into September and, we, you know, the summer winds down, but so many great fellowship times. Men's prayer breakfast on, on Saturday was just a great time, and the Wednesday night prayer meeting, we had like 36 people out for a campfire, and the rain went away, and we got youth group, and we got we got Awana starting, and so many good places to hook in, and I think them become ultimately important for each one of us, because we don't just grow in one day in one book. It takes multiple times of fellowship and, and studying God's word and listening to pastor and hearing those small devotionals that we grow. And then we have a confidence that we do what? We can go boast and tell people about it. I'm glad you're here this morning. Let's go to prayer. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, meet us here today. Thank you for a time that we... We just come together. On a Sunday morning, Father, we, we come into your house to worship you, lift these songs of praise. Many of them have principles, Father, that, that apply so directly to each one of our lives. And so my prayer this morning is that this will be a time of fellowship, a time of worship not a time of requirement that we have to be there because someone told us or we think we have to be there but, but 
Lord, we desire it from the bottom of our heart so that we can, we can celebrate who you are. And in that celebration of who you are, we celebrate who we are. So meet us here today, Father. Whatever our background, whatever our life has brought us, it has brought us here on a Sunday morning to cross our lives in fellowship, to cross our lives in principle and truth, because we'll hear that from the pulpit in a few minutes. So, so give past the right words, Father. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring that type of conviction in each one of our, our lives, Lord. As we hear those words, we're motivated and we're spurred on and, and we make those decisions within within our hearts, Lord, of, of what we do each day. So take us from this building today, Father, out in the streets of society tomorrow, Lord. Give us this, a type of confidence almost a, a, a ability to be able to say to people and in, in, in not in a boastful way but in a very confident way of this is what I believe and this truth changes lives and as it changes lives it changes the way we think and feel and the way we act in society and so Father take us today with a sermon, with a song with our Sunday school lessons they take us where we need to be in the week ahead. Build us up, Father. Give us the joy, yet at the same time, give us the confidence of who you are and what you do in people's lives and, and make this truth so evidently easy to understand that it's not just some superficial truth out of a, out of a book, out of some old book that that we just need to apply because pastor told us to or our Sunday school told us to make it very personal in our heart, in our lives, Lord. So thank you for the hope you give us this day. Thank you for the fellowship time and thank you for loving us unconditionally in all moments of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Forever. 
morning came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Above the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm really glad that you've joined us uh, here at Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, no matter whether you're watching this on Sunday evening or whether you're watching this uh, some other time during the week, I'm really glad that you've chosen to take a little bit of time and connect with the message that we're going to look at together today. We're in the middle of a series on the life of Joseph, and the subtitle is A Man of Faith and Forgiveness. And uh, today we're going to unpack the second part of that again a little bit more. And I'm calling today's message, Stepping Toward Repentance. It's, if you uh, have access to our website, cbcever.org, there's a little QR code right on the top. Or if you received my email yesterday, there's a link to our link tree. Both of those take you to the same place, give you an opportunity to access the version notes or the printable sermon notes. Grab those and grab a Bible. And we're going to be today in Genesis chapter 42. I thought I'd start today with a list of old commercial jingles, and this will test how old you are, whether you can remember any of these. I'll let you just sort of finish them at home there, but to let me put up some of these slides. The first one, my baloney has a first name. How does that end? You remember, it ends, it's O-S-C-A-R, and it's that commercial jingle for Oscar Mayer baloney. Here's another one. I don't want to grow up. How does it end? I'm a Toys R Us kid, right? Uh, from what, back in the 90s, that was a, a thing. I don't know the Toys R Us is even around anymore. The best part of waking up, all right, is Folgers in your cup. Um, true story there. Uh, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. And if you know the rest of the jingle, almonds joy, I have nuts, moms don't. Here's one. I'd like to teach the world to sing. You gotta be really old to know this one. But how does it end? In perfect harmony, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. I saw online that came from like 1975 or something like that. And last one, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, yeah. The old, old commercial for Alka-Seltzer. A great way to start today, right? But it's interesting to me, I saw that list, and it's just interesting to me how some things just sort of come back to you, right? Uh, we can remember jingles from 1975 like they were yesterday, but then if you're like me, you walk into a room and you can't remember why you walked in there. Uh, some things just come back. Other things seem to refuse as much as we try to remember them, refuse to come back. But there's something else true. Some things come back that probably shouldn't come back. Uh, for instance, you've had this happen. How often does it just randomly come back to you how someone said something or did something 
years and years and years ago, but it just pops up out of the blue in your mind. Uh, something that hurt you, something, some situation where you were done wrong, and it just, it just pops into your mind. It sort of just comes back. It might be something you promised that you would forgive. It might be something you've hoped that you could forget. But there it is again. It just sort of pops up. It's tough to deal with those things, isn't it? It's tough to deal with those things well. Our sin nature just wants to sort of stir that pot a little bit, revisit that hurt, reopen that wound, and even though it's long past, still conjecture ways that we could strike back. And it takes God's help to move past that. It takes God's help to move forward from the hurts of the past. But it also takes God's help uh, to do the right thing from the other side of that equation and uh, to own the things that we have done, to own the ways that we have hurt others, and to take tangible steps towards repentance. Now, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning, the other side. Last time we were together, we looked at Joseph having to overcome a difficult past. Today, I want to look at it from his brother's side. Now, you know, frankly, if there's anybody who had the right to hold on to the wrongs other people did to him, it was the man at the center of our study here. Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers. Uh, they sold him into slavery. They then lied about what had happened to him to their father. And that led to this 13-year downhill slide in life that took him to the lowest place that one could imagine. Uh, but at that lowest place, God turned Joseph's life 180 degrees. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at, at Genesis 41 and saw how Joseph had to overcome that, had to overcome that difficult past and began to, began to think about some dynamics in that word forgiveness. He was learning to apply that concept, something that requires supernatural help if we're going to do it the way God says we should, the way he has forgiven us. But God was helping him. God was helping him to forget, he says in, the, in chapter 41, the trouble his brothers had caused and not remember their sins anymore. But, but what about the, the brothers? You know, what about their side? Would they ever take tangible steps towards repentance? Now, at the end of Genesis 41, Joseph is at, finally, right, finally at a good place. He is the prime minister of Egypt. He is using every bit of his God-given abilities to navigate this crisis, leading his nation, coordinating a plan to relieve famine that is impacting the entire world. And he's married. He has two, two young sons. The names that he gave his two sons highlight how deep his relationship with God uh, remained and then you know, it happened, right? It happened. The 10 brothers who did him so wrong 20 years before, they came to town. No one would blame Joseph. Nobody would blame Joseph if in Genesis 42, this story took a dark turn and he tossed all 10 of them into prison and threw away the key. Nobody would have blamed him uh, for that. But Joseph chose a different response. Uh, and the focus of this chapter is how that began to unfold. But I want to really look at it, uh, not so much on Joseph's side, although he's obviously part of the chapter, uh, but on his brother's side. Where were they in owning their sin? Uh, where were they in dealing with their past, the wrongs they had committed? Where were they in stepping toward repentance? The word repentance is a theological word. It's a word that means to, to not only feel sorry about our sin, not only to apologize for our sin, but uh, to make a break and to turn, to turn from that. And it's not going to happen overnight. But we're going to see Joseph's brothers take steps in that direction. That's a really important piece to consider. So if you've got your Bible there, follow along with me. We're going to we're going to begin the first verse of Genesis chapter 42. It says, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? I have heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Jake, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm may, might come to him. 
So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. One of my favorite lines in the Joseph story is Jacob's opening one line there to his sons. Why do you guys just stand around looking at each other? Go buy us some food. It's classic dad talk there. Um, the famine that God had pre-warned Pharaoh uh, that was coming, it had spread far and wide, and Canaan was affected as well. The entire world was ravaged by this famine. The only place in the world that had food, it seemed, uh, was Egypt because Joseph had planned. Joseph had prepared and stockpiled during the seven years of abundance. And so you can just picture this, the masses of people, every nation, every surrounding area streaming to Egypt, following the rumor they heard that there's food there uh, to try and buy food. And mixed in among all those masses of people are the 10 brothers of Joseph. God's providential direction, those specific 10 individuals end up in the same room in front of Joseph, bowing down to him and meekly asking for food. Now, I caption this first section, if you're filling in blanks on your sermon notes there, sometimes dreams do come true. Because 20 years before, Joseph had two dreams that very clearly pointed toward this day. He dreamed that his brother's sheaves of grain would bow down before his sheave of grain. And he dreamed that the stars in the sky that represented his brothers and his parents, that they would all bow down uh, to him as well. And all those years back, which was for Joseph a lifetime ago, his siblings hated him for that. It was what inspired them to plot to kill him and then settle for selling him as a second best option. But here they were, unbeknown to them, doing exactly what had been dreamed all those years before. And it says twice, Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. And notice it says, but he remembered his dreams. Now, you think about this. This was the ultimate opportunity for an I told you so moment. Uh, for 20 years, his life had been on a roller coaster, mostly crashing head down. Uh, and it was all their fault that he'd been through it all. He could have very easily said, you know, you punks thought you had me. Uh, now look who's bowing down to who. But he didn't say that. He didn't do that. He never says that. He never does that. Instead, he begins to examine just where his brothers were at. They say they're honest men. Is that true? Have they grown? Have they changed? And he puts them through what, you know, initially seems to be a little harsh, you'll see. Uh, but... You know, we're tempted to think, you know, he's, he's striking out some personal revenge. But you look close and it really wasn't that severe and it really wasn't that at all. In fact, there's a specific word in there. He's testing them. Joseph is prodding to see if they're willing to deal with their sinful past in a godly way. He had an agenda that, that was intended to help them see, help them understand the pain they'd caused and eventually respond to it in a godly way. Now, at start, he accused them of being spies. When they adamantly resist that charge, he pulls the information from them that he'd been looking for. His dad was still alive, and uh, his little brother was uh, home with his father. But then there's that last line, you know, where I stopped. That had to sting a little bit. Because the brothers say, you know, we're the uh, sons of uh, 12 brothers, the sons of one man. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. 
in the minds of his brothers, Joseph was long gone, likely dead. Certainly, they would never see him again. But it is kind of intriguing, isn't it? That Joseph's absence 20 years later still lingers in their conscience. Now Joseph notices that. And he's about to tug on that string a little bit harder. So you go back to go back to verse 14. And you start to see this. Blanks to tests that awaken seared consciences. Verse 14. Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them in all in custody for three days. Now, you noticed it there. Twice Joseph used the word test. Uh, the last time he'd send the, seen these 10 guys, they were enthusiastic about doing evil toward him. And he's got this question, you know, are they different? Had they changed? Was his little brother in jeopardy? Is that why dad kept him home? Uh, was he in jeopardy just like I had been in jeopardy 20 years before? He had no way knowing. And so he proceeded to put them through a series of tests. And the first involved locking them up for three days with the threat that they were going to stay there, except one brother could go back and bring, and bring that youngest brother to town in order to prove their integrity. And then verse 18, uh, Joseph changes his tune. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you'll live, for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your younger brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. He says there, you know, I, d I decided I'm just going to keep one of you as collateral. The rest can go back to your families, take the grain, feed your starving households. But the only way to validate your story and the only way to get this one brother back uh, is to bring your youngest brother here. And twice he threatens them with death, uh, something that he had been threatened with by them. 20 years before, but that just deepens the requirement for response. But there's one little thing in there. Maybe you noticed it when I read over it or not, but one little thing in there that you just, you know, you'd glance right past if you weren't stopping to think about it. Joseph says to them, do this and live for I fear God. Now, the Hebrew word, the word that he used there is the specific Old Testament word for the God of Abraham. It's the Hebrew name Yahweh or sometimes translated Jehovah. Uh, he didn't name any of the Egyptian deities in his speech to them. You'd expect that. Um, he said, I fear Yahweh, the distinct identity of the God of Abraham, their great grandfather. Now that should have raised some eyebrows. It doesn't <laughs> seem to have really sunk in. Uh, with these brothers at all. But it did implant in this conversation a subtle reminder about their God, the God of their forefathers. And it was part of Joseph's testing designed to awaken the seared conscience of his brothers. And it worked because you look at what happens next. Verse 21, they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. I think in the spiritual journey of these 10 brothers together, uh, the ten oldest sons of Jacob, those might be some of the most significant verses in uh, the book of Genesis. Three days of Egyptian confinement uh, shook the dust off their long overlooked offense. All those years before, their minds go straight back to what they did to Joseph, not knowing he was right there. Their minds went straight back there. Their conscience stirred that up. Um, and they come to this conclusion, whether it's true or not, God's punishing us now because of what we did back then. In Hebrew, uh, 
the word translated we, it's written in emphatic, in an emphatic way over and over again, just sort of really stressing what they're saying. We are being punished, and we saw how distressed our brother was, and we would not listen, and we must give an accounting for his blood. And if you remember the story back in Genesis 37, Reuben, the oldest, was the only one who tried to circumvent the whole thing and rescue his brother. He brings that up here as well. But they realized together, you know, we had this coming. We sinned against our little brother. We refused to listen to his cries for help. And now we must give an accounting for his blood. We brought this on ourselves. Last week in our granddaughter, Ada, uh, was uh, to visit up at our home for a little while. She's 19 months old. She's a ball of energy uh, most of, of the time. I put a little video up here just so you can get a glimpse of uh, Ada uh, down at the splash pad. She's just adorable. And Ada loves animals. Uh, they have a dog at their house that is her best buddy. And at our house, we don't have any dogs. We just have an old crotchety cat. But when Ada came in, uh, she fell instantly in love, and she chased old Scoot all over the house, climbed up, got in his face, you know, expecting the cat to lick her face like the dog does, um, but uh, did that whenever she could, uh, tried to pet him, you know, the whole thing, and he was not very thrilled with the arrangement at all. Uh, figured that heading down in the basement uh, was one escape where he could not follow, but it wasn't smart enough to stay down there. He kept coming back up. Uh, the other escape that Scoot discovered was he could go into our bed, you know, in the center of our bed, and little Ada couldn't climb up onto that on her own, couldn't reach him if he, if he was in the middle of the bed, and he was safe from her there. Over the years, I think we've had Scoot you know, 13 years, more than that maybe, uh, Scoot has developed this annoying habit of whining in a very pitiful way every single morning. It starts usually at 6 o'clock. I don't need an alarm clock. He knows I get up at 6 o'clock. And so he starts to whine, and he continues to do that until he feels he said his piece long enough and uh, goes back for a day-long nap on the couch. But in any case, after being chased all over on Friday night all over the house, one would think that the cat would adjust the morning routine Saturday morning. Uh, you know, don't wake up that little girl that uh, terrorized me uh, Friday night. Um, but not Scoot, not smart enough to figure that out. He started whining well before anyone was up. And uh, I did get up, proceeded to explain to him that he, if he woke up the baby, he would be sorry uh, about that. Uh, but you know what? He didn't care. Didn't listen to me at all. In fact, he went down the hallway, stood right outside the guest room, right outside where they were sleeping, and uh, practiced some of his loudest moaning right there. And when Ada got up, I had zero, zero sympathy on old Scoot. I told you not to wake her up, but you wouldn't listen, and you got what you had coming. Now, the consciences of Joseph's brothers um, told them that same message. We had this coming. We had this coming. Uh, those consciences may have grown cold over 20 years. The rest of life was lived and whatnot, but it still festered back there. It still festered. And it's interesting that when they began to experience some of the things that maybe they imagined Joseph had experienced in the same place that he experienced them in Egypt, their consciences were reactivated again. We had this coming. We had this coming because of what we did to Joseph all those years before. Now, like I read there, Joseph heard that. Um, he heard them. He sensed it happening. Their hearts were softening. The genuine sorrow of what they had done was emerging. They were taking steps towards repentance, but his test was not quite done. Uh, we stopped at verse 23, go to verse 24. It says, He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. 
At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this God has done to us? It's an interesting twist. They end up with the money back in their sacks they'd used to pay for the grain. Uh, in a generous act of grace, Joseph provided for his entire family all the food that they would need to feed their family, and it didn't cost them a dime. Joseph gave them their money back. Your money's not good here. Now, they didn't understand it that way, at least not yet. But I think Joseph did. But it also became another piece sort of in this test and in this movement uh, of the brothers' repentance. See, you notice verse 28 there where I stopped. Joseph had introduced God, Yahweh, in his mention in verse 18. He was an individual who feared the same God that they knew. But now it's the brothers saying, what is this thing? What is this thing God has done to us? Their consciences are stirred. They feel the guilt of their long past unconfessed crime. They realize God knew all along. And God has a way of bringing justice for unaddressed sin. There's also this. For the second time now, uh, they were going to have to return to their father with extra money in their hands, uh, but one less brother and try and explain that to their dad. Caption 3, telling dad, just like 20 years before. Verse 29, when they came to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, the man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us, treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. We, we were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more. The youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is Lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are are not spies but honest men then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land as they were emptying their sacks there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver when they and their father saw the money pouches they were frightened their father Jacob said to them you deprived me of my children Joseph is no more Simeon is no more and now you want to take Benjamin everything is against me then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead. He's the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Now, unlike 20 years before, the brothers tell the story straight this time. No made up. Uh, Stories, no fanciful conjecture. They retell it exactly the way it happened, and it's recorded that way to make that point. Um, even though it still seemed a little bit unbelievable, that's how it happened. And they were honest. They were being honest men at that point. It says something about who they had been growing to become. Um, just like he did 20 years before, Reuben, the oldest, again, steps in to try and get Simeon back. He makes a obviously foolish suggestion to his father, you know, let me take Benjamin down there, and if I don't bring Simeon back and Benjamin back, you can kill my two sons. And I say it's ridiculous because what grandfather in the world is there that would uh, kill his own grandsons? It's a ridiculous proposal. But Reuben stayed true to form, tried to be the responsible brother. Jacob would have none of that. In fact, to hear Jacob at this late stage in his life as a man who has misplaced his faith in God. He cherished his sons from Rachel more than he seemed to trust God himself. Uh, you hear the weight in his words. You've deprived me of my children. Joseph's no more. Simeon's no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like everything is against you. 
everything that can go wrong has gone wrong everything is against me I think the critical reminder in Joseph's story and Jacob's life here is that actually though Joseph, Jacob felt that way actually the opposite was true God was working everything in Jacob's life the things that he saw as so horrible and moving against him, God was working in every one of those things for Jacob's ultimate good. Because of what had happened to Joseph, the family of Jacob would survive, would have food when the rest of the world was starving, and would prosper for a time in a land of plenty. Everything wasn't against him. And when you feel that way, it's not true either. Everything is not against you. If you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you can be certain of that. The Bible is very clear. Now, it's kind of a sad place to step away from this story, but, but we need to hit the pause button uh, for this Sunday. We'll come back to it later. But I want you to think about how this connects to us how this connects to our lives. And, and you'll see on your handout there, I put a few things down, things to think about, sort of takeaways from this. Uh, what can we apply from this to our own lives? Here's the first one. Step one in moving towards repentance is taking responsibility for your sin and sensing God's awareness of it. Um, I listened to a Tim Keller sermon this past week in which uh, he was describing the challenges that a person faces who, who accepts that there is no God. You know, it comes to that belief, that worldview, that there is no God to whom we are accountable. And uh, Keller made a statement that I thought was just really profound, and so I wrote it down. I want to share it with you. He said that that type of individual that, that says, no, I don't believe there is a God. What you see is all that there is. Um, that person is left with two unwelcome options. And he said, if there is no judgment day, what hope is there for the world? But if there is a judgment, what hope is there for me? If there is no such thing as God, no, no one to whom we are accountable to, then there is no objective standard for what's right and wrong. And you can't tell me to do this, and I can't tell you to do that. Uh, and uh, no one can say what is right or wrong. There is no objective standard, uh, no greater being to one to whom we are accountable. And the end result of that is the world has been on chaos. And I think if you look at the world in which we live in right now, uh, everyone just does their own thing. And we're likely seeing a lot of the mess in our culture because too many people have that perspective. That what I think is right, and I don't care what you think, but from the other side, what I think is right, and I don't care what you think, and there's not an objective standard. There's no God to whom we are accountable at large. But the second half of what Keller said there, if there is a future judgment, then each of us must answer for our own violations of the standards of that eternal God. And that leaves us all in a pretty rough place. And yet, like I put in the second part of that opening statement, that's the starting point for the gospel. It's the starting point for understanding the gospel. The scriptures are very clear that we are all sinners. We have all violated the standards of the eternal God. We all fall short and no one does what's right. We all stand guilty before God. The Bible is so very clear. And if we're honest with ourselves, we prove that in our own lives over and over and over again. And if that was all that the scriptures observed, was that all people are rotten and all people do what's wrong, there wouldn't be a whole lot of hope in going to the Bible. But that is far from all that the scriptures contain. It is just the start of the story. The gospel message is that God was not content to let sinners spend eternity being judged for all of the rotten things that we have done, thought, and said. And so he intervened. Jesus, God's eternal son, came here, a descendant from Abraham and this family that we're studying, a descendant from David. Uh, Jesus, God's eternal son, came here, took on a, a human body, born as a baby at Christmas, living the one perfect sinless life that has ever been lived, all so that he could die on the cross and in doing so, take on himself the judgment of God that every one of us deserve. Jesus, God's son, willingly took 
justice for your wrongs and for my wrongs. Now, only God could do that. Only God himself could take the punishment you deserve that everyone deserves on himself. Only God himself could do that. And Jesus did. He died, he was buried, he rose again to satisfy justice for every sin uh, that every individual person has committed since the beginning of time. Um, people like you and people like me. And he offers salvation. He offers salvation to every person who will choose to believe in him. And I hope you've done that. I hope you've responded to that. I hope that you recognize the truth in that, that as much as you don't want to admit it, you are a sinner and deserve God's judgment. But there's an answer. There is hope. And it's Jesus Christ, God's Son, who died, was buried, and rose again for you to give you forgiveness and eternal life. But you have to believe in Him. You have to put your faith in Him. I hope you've done that. But if you haven't, I would invite you today, right now, while I'm still talking about the other parts of this, to talk to Him and settle that and accept the salvation Jesus is offering as a gift to you. If you have responded to that, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you realize the second part of what I'm about to say is equally true, that even as Christians who have been forgiven, uh, for whom we know we have a relationship with God and there is no condemnation that we need to fear for eternity, we still sin, we still screw up way too many times, right? Uh, we have wrong thoughts, we, we uh, do wrong things, we say wrong things. Too often we choose to sin. And sometimes that sin is against somebody else. Uh, it doesn't put our salvation in jeopardy because Jesus died for every sin. But it does affect our relationship with God. It does affect our relationship with others when we sin against them. And the Bible outlines a pattern to follow. I want to share a few verses here. here the first one is maybe the most important. Um, 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, John is writing to believers. You read the first chapter and you realize that. And he paints it pretty plain. He says, If you say you don't sin, you're a liar. The truth isn't in you. Uh, we all still struggle. We all still uh, fall, we all still sin. But when we do, the path back, the steps towards repentance involve confessing our sin, owning that, and admitting that to God. And it pro the promise is very clear there that God is faithful, God is just, God will forgive us and purify us. There's a pattern throughout uh, the scriptures that include taking responsibility for our sin, confessing it to God, confessing it to those that we've hurt in the process. Uh, for 20 years, Joseph's brothers ignored that. Uh, they had ignored that, and it leads to my second takeaway here. Ignoring and covering up sin, it only leads to a callous conscience. It only leads to a callous Conscience And God wants us to instead admit our guilt, confess it, seek forgiveness, and then turn. That's what repentance is, turn from it. But when we disregard that process, he does have a way of introducing experiences we would much rather avoid. You see it in Joseph's. They, they felt it. His brothers felt that. But there's other examples. One of the classic examples, I think, in the Old Testament comes from David's life. He was described as a man after God's own heart. Uh, he was Israel's greatest king. He was the one through whom the eternal king, Jesus Christ, would come and would sit on the throne forever of, of David. But David was still a sinner, and sometimes David sinned in horrible ways. Now, once in particular, it's hard to believe this, hard to imagine this if you didn't know the story already, that once in particular he committed adultery with one of his closest friend's wife, and uh, then when she became pregnant, he had his friend killed uh, to cover it up. And it took a prophet of God going to David, getting boldly in the king's face to point out his sin. 
and before he broke. But when he did, David then penned the words of Psalm 32. I want to share it with you. David wrote this, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. When David ignored his sin, when David uh, refused to own his sin, when he, David pretended nobody knew, forgetting that God is aware of everything that we do, he felt the heavy hand of God on him. Joseph's brothers, after just three days in prison, have the perspective, God knows what we did, and God's heavy hand was on their consciences. But the second half of that psalm, the next couple of verses, David says this, but then, then, after feeling God's heavy hand, then I acknowledged my sin to you, did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That is the path to follow. That is the path to follow, and it's much wiser to step that path quicker than later. Uh, to keep short accounts with God and with others instead of pushing something under the carpet for 20 years like those brothers did. It came back. They didn't escape. God has a way of causing us to reap what we sow. God has a way of bringing undealt with sin back around. And so follow the Bible's pattern to deal with it early, to deal with it soon. Own it, admit it, ask for forgiveness sooner rather than later. It's the steps towards repentance. But there's one last thing I wanna toss out there for you to think about this morning, and it's sort of the other side, it's Joseph's side. And I, I word it this way, being on the receiving end of sin is very hard, but it also gives you an enormous opportunity. It gives you an enormous opportunity. There's been conjecture on why uh, Joseph put the money back in his brother's packs. Uh, maybe in heaven one day we can ask him and find out his real motivation for doing that. But I like to think that it was because uh, Joseph decided, you know what, I'm going to keep my promise. Uh, last time we talked about forgiveness as a promise to not remember the sins of others against us, to release that. Um, and I like to think that Joseph had that mentality now toward his brothers. They'd hurt him so deeply. You meant it for evil uh, towards me, but I am paying it back with good. I am paying it back with good. I am not taking your money, uh, but instead I'm going to abundantly, I'm going to graciously, I'm going to overwhelmingly give you all that you need to feed your families. No charge, completely free. Being on the receiving end of sin is hard, but it gives you this opportunity to consider, how should I respond to that? How can I show God in that? What, they, what uh, Joseph did was not easy. Responding to wrong do un, done to us with forgiveness is very hard. Just that step is extremely hard. But going past it to repay evil with good is extraordinary. And yet, Joseph does it. Why? Because I think maybe it's an awful lot like God. Second part, last part on there is, though it's extremely counterintuitive, entrusting justice to God frees us up to demonstrate undeserved, overwhelming grace. I don't know which part of this story connects with your life the most. Maybe you're someone that recognizes that uh, there are some undealt with offenses that need to be owned and addressed. I hope that you will take the challenge from this this morning. I hope that maybe the Holy Spirit even has stirred your conscience a little to, to, to recognize, you know what, I need to own that. I need to go to that person. I need to ask for their forgiveness. I need to turn. I need to turn from my sin. If that's you, I hope that you'll take that step. If uh, you're one this morning and this story really connects with you in the part of life where you've been on the receiving end of wrong and need to consider to forgive, maybe need to consider to take even a further step. Be like Joseph. Respond to evil done to you with good, completely un undeserved, 
but abundant, uh, overwhelming grace. Think about that. And then lastly, you know, maybe you're one who um, most importantly needs to respond to the amazing gift of salvation Jesus died to provide you. We all need it because we're all sinners. And if this morning you're unsure uh, that you've ever done anything with what Jesus did to pay for all the wrong things you've done, I hope that today's the day that you settle that. I wonder, you know, we come to Bible stories like this and, and read through these different things and, and you know, I'm giving you three different directions to maybe consider how it applies in your life. I wonder what it would look like if you responded to your situation that you're in right now, the setting you find yourself in right now, the way God is prodding you to, what would that look like? What steps should you take? Could I close this morning by challenging you today, tomorrow? Take those steps. It might be hard, but do it. Do those things. Take the steps God wants you to take in your spiritual journey. I pray with me and we're going to say goodbye for this week. Father God, thank you so much for this passage. Thank you so much for the example of Joseph and even the stirring of the brothers' hearts and the awareness of needing to rightly deal with the sinful choices in their past is something that can connect to our lives. And I don't know who's watching this and how they need to respond, but you do. And I pray that you will, uh, your Holy Spirit will take the truth of uh, this chapter and prod hearts. Uh, we all need to take some step in our life. We all need to grow. We all need to change. We all need to move forward in our spiritual journey with you. And my prayer is that now whatever that is, however that looks, that today we'll make those decisions and take those steps moving forward with Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.